I'll try to be brief with this discussion, but I can't promise it's going to go as fast as I really want it to. When we let off last time, we were talking about the Loyalists and the Tories, those who, the colonists who were still loyal to Britain during the Revolution. Uh, we also introduced the Hessians, which were the, the paid mercenaries from the province of Hesse in Germany that were employed to fight against the colonists in the Revolutionary War. So let's talk about this New York campaign. In George Washington's first major battle against the British forces, he showed a complete lack of understanding of the Redcoat tactics. And since the British had abandoned Boston after Bunker Hill, Washington believed that British troops that were led by William Howe would attack New York City from Long Island. So Washington troops, Washington's troops are going to meet Howe on Long Island, and they're going to be soundly defeated. However, to his credit, Howe's going to fail to follow through with this attack. So Washington is going to be given an opportunity to withdraw to Manhattan. Um, and Washington will cross into New Jersey um, once he sees Howe advancing to the rear of his forces. And once he's in New Jersey, Howe isn't going to be able to use his massive naval support against Washington and his troops. So while Washington was fortunate that Howe's forces didn't completely crush his troops, he still considers the New York campaign a moral victory because he's going to be able to adapt his strategies to make sure that he's not going to repeat the mistakes he had made in the New York campaign. That's one of the unique things about Washington. He's not going to be so arrogant that he doesn't believe he can make a mistake. He's going to make those mistakes and he's going to learn from them, which is going to make him an excellent general in the long run. So let's talk about the battles of Trenton and Princeton. These are late in uh, 1776. So after suffering a serious defeats in the New York campaign, Washington is going to decide to plan this daring attack on British positions at Trenton and Princeton, which are in New Jersey. And by that time, Howe had already retreated to his winter quarters. It was accepted during this time of battle and war that during the winter time you would retire and you would come back out in the spring to fight when it was better weather. So as part of his plan, Washington and his men are going to make a dangerous crossing of the ice-clogged Delaware River on Christmas night, 1776. And we could get into some, um, some additional history here about the Hessians and their um, the way they celebrated uh, Christmas and Christmas Eve. But they had had a party, so to speak, uh, all day on Christmas Day and uh, were quite sleeping very well on Christmas night when Washington arrives with his men. So him and his men are going to arrive in Trenton early, early the after, the next morning after Christmas. And the Hessian troops that are stationed in Trenton are either going to flee in disorder or going to be captured by Washington's forces. In all, the Americans are going to take about 900 prisoners. And later that week, Washington troops are going to win another victory at the Battle of Princeton. Um, however, both his troops and the British ones stationed there are going to have to go into winter quarters after this battle. Um, while the battle doesn't have much strategic importance, Princeton, the victories are going to give Washington's men a boost in morale, and they're going to they're going to help them maintain this morale um, into the next year, which is going to be good for Washington because throughout this he's going to struggle with his his men being motivated. Um, when things get hard, they simply just go home because they have that ability here. Um, and, and just keeping them there with, with little supplies, with little resources, with very little money to actually pay them. So let's look at some of the discussion questions. We answered one and two last time, so let's look at number three. What happens at the Battle of Trenton and Princeton, and what was the significance of these battles? If you'll answer that in your notes, let's uh, go ahead and continue. So let's talk about the fall of Philadelphia. Colonial forces are going to suffer a major setback in September of 1777 when British troops led by General Howe are going to defeat Washington's troops again in the Battle of Brandywine Creek, which is right outside of Philadelphia, which is located in, in the today the state, then the colony of um, Pennsylvania. So Howe had originally been ordered to march to Albany, New York to line up with General Burgoyne and Colonel Barry St. Lager in an attempt to separate New England from the southern colonies. But instead, he's going to march to Pennsylvania. Washington, unwisely, is going to move his forces out of position, and it's going to make it easy for the British to, to take the city unopposed. But before the British take Philadelphia, the Continental Congress flees the city, because that's where they were meeting at, remember Independence Hall in Philadelphia, and they're going to move to Lancaster and later to York, which are both in Pennsylvania. And I'll tell you a cool story about that in class.
So let's talk about the British strategy. What strategy were they trying to use to uh, win this war? If you watch that very long video that um, I posted for you at, at, during the last project, um, the three, they called the Cerberus, the three generals that the king are going to send to um, defeat these Americans, Burgoyne, St. Leger, and Howe. Um, they're going to launch this three-pronged attack. So the British strategy is going to depend upon this three-pronged attack in which separate military forces are going to converge on New York, assembling a massive force at Albany. The British are going to plan to separate New England from the southern colonies. Because remember at the very, very beginning, and you looked at this in your active classroom activity, most of those battles during the early years of the war, 1776 to 1777, are going to take place in New England. So, in an effort to end this right here, the British are going to attempt to cut off the New England colonies from the rest of the southern colonies. It also crippled the Americans' ability to fight effectively. So, according to this strategy, General Burgoyne would lead his army down from Canada along Champlain to Albany, New York. And at the same time, Colonel St. Leger would march his troops from Port Oswego to New York. And finally, General Howe would sell his forces up the Hudson River and arrive in Albany. So this plan was for three armies to link up in New York, making it an unbeatable force. However, none of the commanders are really going to get to their uh, destination on time. Colonial troops are going to be led by Nicholas Herkimer, and he's going to harass St. Leger's forces, which are also going to be slowed due to fighting in another battle in Fort Stanwix. Colonial soldiers are then going to attack and defeat Burgoyne and his army, at Saratoga, and we're going to talk about that in just a second, and how um, had already made the decision to capture Philadelphia rather than to meet up with the British forces in Albany. So there's this plan. Perhaps it would have worked if the generals would have followed it, but neither none of the, the British generals are going to follow the plan, and so therefore their strategy falls. What are Burgoyne's mistakes? So Burgoyne's expedition to Albany is full of errors which eventually is going to prove fatal to the British Army. And while he's a good soldier, General Burgoyne tended to be very overconfident and probably didn't plan for the New York campaign as effectively as he should have. He was extremely over-equipped for the march. Um, his forces numbered over 7,000, but also include 30 carts uh, with his own personal wardrobe and loaded in those, over 100 pieces of unusable artillery, cases of champagne in order to celebrate victories, um, and he's going to become bogged down in the forest. He doesn't know the terrain, which is one of the advantages that the colonists have in this fray. Um, in addition, continental forces are further going to be slowed by having to cut down trees along the roads to even help the army march through. His army is uh, slowed down to a crawl, traveling less than one or two miles per day. And before long, American troops are going to have his forces surrounded, and he is going to be under siege. This is a major turning point in, in the war for the Americans. This is known as the victory at Saratoga. So let's talk about this. As Burgoyne's troops are going to slog through the wilderness, American forces under General Philip Schuyler, Horatio Gates, and Benedict Arnold begin to build an extremely strong defensive position at Saratoga, New York, which is in upstate New York. Um, Burgoyne, Burgoyne, sorry, men are going to attempt twice to overrun their position, but they're not going to be able to break through. Um, more and more troops are going to fortify the American position in Saratoga, and Burgoyne is going to find himself under siege. And his men are constantly under fire. And when British General Clinton failed his attempt to reinforce the British position at Saratoga, Burgoyne is going to have no choice, and he's going to surrender on October 17, 1777. Wentworth Cheswell um, is an African-American who's going to serve as a constable and community leader and during the Revolutionary War, he serves as a messenger for Newmarket. And his, his important task was to carry news to and from the township of Exeter. And when Paul Revere did his famous ride warning the British, of the British invasion, the town of Portsmouth asked for help from local communities. So Newmarket sends 30 armed men. Well, Wentworth Cheswell um, accompanied them to give instructions as well as to build rafts to aid the defense of Portsmouth Harbor, and he was also a member of a voluntary cavalry unit under John Langdon during the Saratoga campaign. So Wentworth Cheswell is going to see action in this um, Saratoga campaign. 
So let's look at the importance of the Battle of Saratoga. And we know this in history is that this British loss at Saratoga is going to convince the French to aid Americans, which isn't entirely true because the French were already aiding the Americans. They just weren't letting the British know about it. So after the Battle of Saratoga, they're going to be overt in their support of this American fight for independence. So in history, we consider this battle as the reason that we secured that France's support in the American Revolution. Um, the French want revenge for their own losses in the French and Indian War, and they provide us aid. France probably would have entered the war on the South Americans anyway, since its government had been building up its navy in an effort to take the British Navy's place as the strongest of the seas. And in addition, the colonists are going to send Benjamin Franklin to France to try to gain its support. Um, interestingly enough, Benjamin Franklin had been in England up until the point of the war, the conflict, and then he goes to France. So he spends a lot of the time um, during the war when it's being fought um, out of the country. His efforts are going to play a big part in convincing the French, French to give the Patriots aid. And King Louis the Fourteenth is going to authorize France to spend millions in order to help the Continental Army uh, rearm. Following France's lead, the Spanish are also going to offer assistance and because they want to see the British defeated as well. France, sorry, the English during their phrase in England or in Europe are going to make a lot of enemies with the other European countries. And this is going to come back to bite them, so to speak, during this conflict with the American colonies because the, the other um, European countries are very much going to want to hurt the British Empire and will aid with the colonists in order to strike a blow to the British Empire. Um, another side point here, the French are going to give the Americans so much support during the American Revolution that it is going to bankrupt their country. Once it bankrupts their country and their people can't eat, that's going to lead to a revolution in France, and we'll talk about that when we begin um, talking about the new republic in America. So France is going to sign a treaty of alliance with the Americans. They're going to offer to provide military assistance in return for our pledge to come to France's aid if needed. And again, we'll, we'll talk about that um, in a few weeks when the French are going to go to war. Um, well, they're going to have a rebellion, um, and they're going to ask the Americans for help. The Americans won't quite come good on their word in this instance. The French and the American envoys are also going to sign a treaty of amity and commerce in which France is going to recognize American independence and enter into trade agreements with a new nation. And this is important for us to get our footing um, in the world. Bernardo de Galvez, under orders from Charles III of Spain, smuggles supplies into the North American rebels. Um, Galvez also intercepts a letter intended for Brit a British general and was able to launch a successful military campaign against the British at the start of the war. He successfully captured the British capital of West Florida, Pensacola, and as a skilled commander, he was able to keep supply lines going to the American rebels, as well as manage uh, Spanish interests in the war effort. He's an important figure in American history, and he prevented uh, the British forces from encircling the American rebels from the south. He's also the namesake of our um, southern city, Galveston. Faced with the likelihood that France would enter the war at the side of the Americans, the British Prime Minister, Lord North, is going to make a final attempt at peace with the colonies. Um, hoping to restore the relationship between them and the mother country, his peace proposal is going to include a provision that will repeal the Hated Tea Act and the Coercive Acts, which we call the Intolerable Acts. Um, Parliament would also promise to never again tax the colonies. Um, and if you look back in history, France had knowledge that the English were going to offer this, this package, this deal to the American colonies, which is why the, the French also are going to expedite their support of the um, American colonies at the, at the point that they did after the Battle of Saratoga. And they do this because they realize that what the British are offering the American colonists is a pretty good deal, and the American colonists might likely take it, which would strengthen the British Empire rather than hurt it. And so in order to, to strike that blow to the British Empire, they're going to offer them support to continue fighting the British. Um, unfortunately, the British government is going to drag its feet in approving the proposal until March of 1778, 
And by this time, the royal envoys got to Philadelphia to negotiate with the Continental Congress. The French and American governments had already negotiated. We had signed treaties. And so the Americans are going to reject the British proposals. But before the British negotiators can leave Philadelphia to return to England, um, word's going to come that the French had followed the terms of the treaty with the Americans and had declared war on England. So that's going to kind of solidify our decision on that. So let's talk about Valley Forge and how important Valley Forge was in the grand scheme of the war. Um, as 1777 is going to draw to a close, Washington's going to look for a suitable winter headquarters to prepare for the upcoming spring and, and summer military campaigns. Um, again, it was common practice for the militaries to retire during the winter time and then to um, bring their armies back out to fight when the weather got better. He's going to choose Valley Forge, Pennsylvania because it was a safe location and it was also close enough to Philadelphia to launch an attack to retake the city from the British. Conditions at Valley Forge are going to be ex extremely harsh on the soldiers. So in addition to the cold winter, Washington's going to have trouble getting supplies of meat, bread, clothing to the men. And again, we talked about it wasn't that there was a lack of resources. It was that the British were offering better prices for the resources from the local colonists. And so the local colonists looking to make money were willing to sell their supplies to the British Army rather than to the American Army. So long marches had destroyed the shoes of many of these continental troops and blankets were in short supply. Um, tales of seeing the blood from their feet in the, in the snow, their footprints in the snow are going to come out of Valley Forge. And living in crowded and damp quarters, many of Washington's soldiers are going to become ill. They're going to suffer diseases such as typhoid and pneumonia. And nearly 2,000 of the soldiers are going to die from these illnesses. So at one point, due to supply shortages, nearly 4,000 men were listed as unfit for duty. Hundreds of horses are also going to die or couldn't be used because of cold or lack of food. Um, however, the silver lining in this Valley Ford ordeal is going to be the training that the um, soldiers are going to receive here. Foreign officers, including Prussian drill master Frederick von Steuben, and if you don't know anything about militaries of the world, the Prussian army was one of the best militaries in the world. They were very disciplined, very skilled, and, and ruthless. So to have this guy here teaching our troops um, how to march and how to fire their weapons more effectively was definitely a benefit on our side. Um, it's going to make them more capable during the spring campaigns. So in spite of this misery at Valley Forge, the Continental soldiers are going to emerge more confident because they succeed in surviving these harsh conditions and they had techniques, new techniques, to try against the British. Also in Valley Forge, Washington makes the fateful decision to inoculate his troops. Um, he's going to inoculate them against smallpox. A lot of the colonists had lived here long enough to, um, their immunity for smallpox had gone away. So as the British bring over these new diseases, um, they're falling ill. And Washington makes this decision. It's going to take his troops out for about a month, some a little longer, but they're in winter quarters anyways, and those who survive will be immune to this disease after that. A very good decision on the part of Washington. So let's look at these discussion questions, and if you'll answer these in your notes, this will conclude our discussion for today. Um, what was the British three-pronged strategy for defeating the colonies? What mistakes did British General Burgoyne make that led his, to his surrender at Saratoga? Why did France decide to assist the colonies after the Battle of Saratoga? And what steps did they take to aid the colonies? And number four, why did Washington choose to camp at Valley Forge in the winter of 1777? What kinds of conditions did the men endure there? If you'll look at those, answer them in your notes. We'll use those tomorrow in class. Thank you. Happy Halloween.